two and a half years after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, which has shattered peace in Europe and shaken to the core the rules-based international order, posing the greatest threat to transatlantic security in decades, if not longer. Russia's latest strike on a children's hospital in Kyiv testifies to the horrific, brutal, and senseless human cost of Russia's aggression, but one of so many tragedies inflicted by Putin on the people of Ukraine. Under President Biden's leadership. That is Ambassador Michael Carpenter and senior advisor for Europe at the National Security Council, briefing the media before this year's NATO summit in July. He went on to say that NATO and United States have provided critical support to Ukraine, and they will continue to do so. You're listening to The Divide. My name is Iris Xu. This week, we continue our conversation with Dr. Benjamin L. Schmidt. As a security and energy expert, Dr. Schmidt has testified before the U.S. Congress and Canadian Parliament about the sanctions regime against Russia and the responses to Russia's invasion of Ukraine that the cycle of incrementalist measures to support Ukraine, whether it be on the supply of weapon systems urgently needed by Kyiv or on sanctions measures needs to be broken. The time for incrementalism is over. A Western sanctions counteroffensive with stronger and wider restrictions on the Russian Federation can and must be deployed immediately. Global democracies must do this, not only to support the future resiliency of a free Ukraine, but also to make it abundantly clear to the realist it's just a commercial deal block that there cannot be a return to business as usual with uh, with the Putin regime. It's a vital message that authoritarian regimes around the world will need to hear as well. Thank you for your attention. That was from June of last year when Dr. Schmidt testified in Ottawa before the Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development about Canada's sanctions regime against Russia. But where do things stand today? Well, look, I think that it's really important to remember that the sanctions regime that the West has placed on the Russian Federation since its large-scale invasion of Ukraine is the largest ever undertaken in the history of the planet, okay? It's, and the reason I say that is that the Russian Federation's, even though it's, it's not the largest economic uh, power in the, um, in the world, it still has a very large land mass, so it makes, uh, you know, just, just trying to do export, technology export controls and um, you know counter uh, you know uh, sanctions evasion uh, uh, work. It makes it much harder. Uh, the Russian Federation is globally integrated into a lot of economies. That makes it difficult to you know, untangle a lot of this stuff and uh, and make sure that everyone is on board for in, enforcing the sanctions. Um, and uh, you know, and, and and they are, as I said, they have created these energy dependencies, in particular in Europe, that makes it difficult, it at least made it difficult to begin with, for Europe to just simply cut off and sanction uh, Russia because they they need they quote unquote needed the gas, uh, even though they they very rapidly um, in in this case uh, uh, have have moved away from Russian energy dependence. So I, I think that. You know, has anything changed since we last spoke? I, I'd say no. I think the status quo is still there. We haven't seen any more large sanctions regimes or technology export controls packages come out in, in the past couple of months. Uh, but I, I think that in, in general, what we need to focus on is in addition to making sure that we come up with and uh, and move with the trajectory of where these sanctions are going in terms of their, their efficacy, their impact and their scope. Uh, we also need to make sure that enforcement of existing sanctions takes place because you can have the best sanctions policies announced on the planet. Uh, if you don't enforce them, then then it's 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 totally pointless. It's not going to have that that impact, and it's going to make future sanctions regimes and and counter threat financing regimes that that democracies come up with to deal with authoritarian nations all the more difficult to uh, you know basically enforce and have folks take seriously if they think well. You know, it might be on the books, but I can get away with it. I can I can trade in the energy. I can trade in these, uh, you know, microchips and and uh, components that are uh, are possibly dual use goods and uh, and get away with it. And so one of the things that I often point out, I I am not alleging that the U.S. or the EU or anyone else, when it comes to sanctions, is intentionally not enforcing 
uh, the full scope of these sanctions. What I am saying is we are not taking the sanctions as seriously as we generally take military issues. And I think that what we need to see is a, uh, you know, an equal, it won't have to be anywhere near the investment we do in military supplies or, or, or goods or anything like that to defend not only Ukraine, but to defend ourselves in, in general. Uh, but, but to build out our sanctions enforcement officer network, right? I think that if you look at the United States, uh, we probably have around, you know, several hundred uh, people, you know, professionals working on, uh, on sanctions issues in one way or the other uh, at Treasury, at the State Department, at the Department of Energy, uh, you know, experts that are up on Capitol Hill, working with the Senate, working with the House and, and things like this. Um, you know, that's that's not enough because I'm not talking about a several hundred working on Russia sanctions. I'm talking about all of our sanctions regimes have several hundred people working on them. And, and you have thousands and thousands of these uh, components and, and individuals and entities that need to be you know, having sanctions enforced. So I really think we need an order of magnitude more hires to make sure we have professionals that can can meet the challenge. Right. I, I think that they are overworked and, and understaffed for the impacts that people expect. And what that does when you don't enforce them and, and they don't have the advocacy that they need is you have other people who don't want sanctions to be enforced that are either you know, pro-Russia or, or, or one of these other countries that have been had sanctions against it. Uh, they could say, see, sanctions don't work. Don't bother policymakers. Don't, don't even bother uh, passing them. So we need to take this incredibly seriously. I, I, I do want to make it clear to the audience as well. I am not alleging that we should be doing more sanctions and less uh, military support for Ukraine. I think that they both need to be focused on. We are clearly, even now, not doing enough to provide the weapons systems and, um, and, and deliveries at the speed, having the supply chain of weapon systems and, and munitions to Ukraine going as, as quickly as possible uh, to, to help the Ukrainians match the, um, you know, the amount of personnel that the, the Russians are throwing at this. Um, but I think that thankfully uh, we've we've provided attack and uh, you know long range missiles to Ukraine. We've we've finally 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 provided F-16s. Uh, way too late. All of these these steps have been taken basically months or or in some cases years too late. But they've been taken nonetheless. So that's that's good. I will give them credit for this. Uh, but um, again, sanctions uh, in, and technology export controls can take away the ability of the Russian Federation to build up its military arsenal and to to build these munitions and, and shells and things that they're throwing at Ukraine and, and missiles and things like this. Um, so if sanctions are, you have to look at it as an equation, right? Sanctions that are maximized are taking off of the battlefield, not just, not just hurting Russia economically, but taking off of the battlefield physical munitions at the end of the day, if you have a technology export controls regime that sufficiently limits the dual use goods and, and all of the sort of things and com, you know components and subsystems and, and technologies that are needed for those. On one hand, you have the sanctions doing that. It's not enough to completely you know take any anything down strategically, but it does limit the supply chains. That and that's that's incredibly important. And on the flip side, if you want to give slightly less you know munitions to Ukraine to shoot these down, well, increase the sanctions. Right? You increase the sanctions. They have fewer missiles to throw. That means we need to provide fewer uh, interceptor missiles for those uh, those uh, you know you know Patriot systems and things like this. But again, that is thinking a little bit too far ahead. I think it's maybe even too sophisticated uh, for um, you know for for you know the the real time actions of a military conflict like is going on in Ukraine. And therefore, I, I have a simple message: maximize sanctions, maximize technology export controls, and maximize their uh, their enforcement, right? And at the same time, maximize the weapon systems that are going to Ukraine as well. Ukraine has to win this war. It's not something that we want to see grinding along like it has been. On August 23rd, the U.S. Department of the Treasury and the Department of State targeted nearly 400 individuals and entities both in Russia and outside of its borders, including in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, whose products and services enable Russia to sustain its war effort and evade sanctions. It seems clear that the U.S. government will continue to support Ukraine and hold Russia accountable for its aggression. But who is the biggest exporter of dual-use products and weapons to Russia? That is a great question. It really depends 
Uh, it really depends on what we're talking about. There's been reports of uh, uh, the People's Republic of China, of course, having uh, a, a significant trade in dual use goods with uh, with the Russian Federation. But of course, we've seen Iran uh, uh, trade not only dual use goods, but but in particular sending drones and, and missile products themselves, actual weapon systems to the Russian Federation. And we've seen a lot of Central Asian countries suddenly have uh, a gr great increase in trade in what were, um, you know, technologies or 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 goods that, uh, you know, that, that could be repurposed for uh, supporting, um, you know, technology systems for the Russian military, suddenly having spikes in trade, uh, you know, from Europe, from, you know, from other uh, global democracies. And then, then the implication is that those systems are not actually going to uh, the Central Asian countries. They're, they're actually just going onward to the Russian Federation. And so uh, we need to keep in mind that that's, that's really the case. Um, and, you know, we saw these anecdotal stories since the start of the war of, of what is needed for these systems. Not all of these systems that Russia is putting into, uh, into action are incredibly sophisticated, right? They, they were using parts from commercial electronics goods, washing machines, dishwashers, just taking, uh, you know, uh, semiconductor products from, from commercial goods and repurposing it for drones and for missiles and things like this. And, and again, we have to remember it's not just you know, trade in weapon systems themselves, but the technology subsystems that is, is so, so important. So, uh, you know, we really, really need to make sure that um, that at least among the countries that are participating in these sanctions and technology export controls regimes, um, whether they're in Europe, whether in, they're in East Asia, Southeast Asia, North America, et cetera, um, we really need to get our house in order and make sure that we're not contributing to the problem first and then focus on um, the, the secondary sanctions needed to stop them from other nations uh, getting into, into the Russian Federation. Yes, we must make sure that we are not contributing to the problem. But last month, the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, a nonprofit organization based in Finland, found that Taiwan's imports of Russian coal rose 31% in the last 12 months. The report says Taiwan's imports of other Russian fossil fuels have also risen in the past year, with volumes of Russian oil products shooting up over 200 percent in the past 12 months compared to the prior 12 months. And since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Taiwan has bought 2.9 billion U.S. dollars of Russian oil products, contributing an estimated 600 million U.S. dollars to the Kremlin in tax revenues, which goes towards financing Putin's war. I've called on that. I've called on every democracy worldwide to just basically end any uh, energy trade with the Russian Federation. And, and again, as we've talked about in the past, I, I think that to some extent Taiwan was continuing, I believe, with, with coal imports and, and things like this. Uh, this all has to, to, to end, uh, and it has to end as quickly as possible. Again, in a lot of cases, Countries have not put down sanctions regimes because of energy dependencies in various sectors, whether it be natural gas or oil or um, or, or, or coal or things like this. Uh, of course, we see that the um, you know the G7 didn't put together a uh, sanctions regime on Russian oil, but rather a price cap, trying to quote unquote have their cake and eat it too, as we say, right? To to somehow continue to import Russian oil. Uh, while at the same time restricting Russian revenues, and and that's, you know, frankly not worked uh, that well, right? It, 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 and so the the goal has to be a complete uh, end of our reliance on authoritarian source um, energy products, and and so I think Taiwan uh, and policymakers in Taiwan are clear right about that. They understand uh, the threats of of reliance and uh, threats from authoritarian nations. Uh, you know, certainly. Uh, you know, in in the cross strait region, that's that's evident. But I think globally, they understand the the, the parallels with uh, with Ukraine's plight uh, uh, with respect to Russia, and um, and so I, I think they will they will get there. But again, global democracies, not just Taiwan, everybody needs to step up their act to end any imports and any reliance on these uh, these these Russian energy products. Because every time we spend any money that is going to the Russian Federation for these products. That money can be repurposed to support Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, support Russian war crimes against Ukrainian civilians, 
and, and all of the other uh, sabotage and, and malign influence and, and other operations that they have launched against global democracies, um, that's so, so important. And, and so, uh, again, I was heartened by it. Was... For us to not be complicit in Putin's war against Ukraine, are there any alternative energy resources that both Europe and Taiwan can cultivate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's 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 so important. And again, you know, this this discussion of hydrocarbons uh, and the hydrocarbon dependencies that that Europe had on on Russia is is in some ways overlooking, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, promoting the need for our energy transition to go as quickly as possible because building out renewable energy systems not only allows for uh, the potential of um, you know distributed energy networks that are more resilient to physical attacks and sabotage and things like this, not immune, I will make that very clear, not immune at all, uh, but possibly more uh, resilient in some ways. Uh, you know, it's hard to blow up a thousand different windmills, uh, but it's easy to blow up a, a cable or a pipeline or something like that um, in, in the subsea or in the offshore. Um, and so, so we need those, and of course, it's also important for for addressing the climate crisis and and uh, and making sure that we get through the energy transition. So Europe is clear eyed about that. I think their um, you know their their repower EU plan has made it very clear that they they want to do both things at once: is increase their energy security and 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 increase the speed with which they uh, they move forward in in the energy transition work that they're they're already focused on. Uh, but at the same time, in the short term, um, making sure Europe's energy uh, resilience on, you know, swapping uh, hydrocarbons for hydrocarbons or, or things like this that were cut off by Russia, that was the, the biggest and most acute uh, problem. You're not going to be able to build the renewable energy infrastructure at a pace that's fast enough to, um, you know, to outrun a overnight cutoff in natural gas from Russia. And so that's why we saw uh, in the early uh, months after the war, began in, um, in, in 2022, uh, European nations very, very rapidly ending their dependence on Russian natural gas to the greatest extent possible and building out floating storage and regasification units for LNG, you know, these floating LNG terminals, such that they can uh, replace that resource on a short-term basis with, um, with LNG. And the idea is that on a longer-term basis, they can then build out the renewable energy infrastructure that not only makes them energy resilient and energy secure, but also, of course, is, is uh, reducing emissions and uh, you know, meeting uh, climate targets. On August 24th, the European Commission released a video showing its support for Ukraine. Ukraine belongs in the EU. The EU will support Ukraine to rebuild and recover on its path to the EU. Through the Ukraine facility, the EU is providing 50 billion euros in grants and loans over the next four years. The EU has put in place hard-hitting sanctions to hamper Russia's war efforts and immobilized over 210 billion euros of Russian central bank assets. Our union continues to stand up for Ukraine with unity, strength and resolve. Despite all its support to Ukraine, Europe's decoupling with Russian energy products still has a long way to go. In 2023, Europe still imported about 14.8% of its total gas supply from Russia, with 8.7% arriving via pipelines. And Taiwan has imported 3.5 billion US dollar worth of Russian coal since the start of the invasion of Ukraine. And imports have risen 31% in the past 12 months. As long as someone is buying Russia's energy products, Putin will be able to use that money to finance his war in Ukraine. So ask your parliament members, senators, representatives to stop buying Russian oil as well as other energy products. This episode of The Divide is produced by Radio Taiwan International. If you like the program, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.